Hi students, Logan Phillips here, or Professor P. Today we're going to be talking about the history of computers, where we came from, things that led us up to where we currently are at, the technology, the places, the events, everything that sort of has merged together to create our modern environment and is going to be setting the basis for ourselves going forward. So let's jump in, check out the presentation. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always email me at loganperiodphillips1 at tulsacc.edu. You can give me a call at 918-595-7485. Hey, give me one second, I'll turn this phone on secret. All right, our silent. And so let's go ahead and jump in and check out uh, this lesson. Now, I will tell you, this is one of my favorite lessons. The history, modern, and future of technology are three things that I love talking about. And so we're going to do this with a lecture series. Each week, you're going to have a different video comes out and a small assignment of my choosing at the end of it. Uh, I will be posting information about what the assignment is to your Blackboard page underneath the lecture series uh, folder. So just check those out and check out your assignment. Make sure you get those turned in for your 10 points. Now the objectives for this particular lesson are pretty straightforward. We're going to discover the age of computers. Uh, we're going to discuss the implications of the computers in our history. We're going to talk about important discoveries and we're going to talk about important people. And so next a quick review of basics of technology. I want you to keep these things in mind when you're working through your lecture series, when you're working on your computer concepts class. Um, you're going to hear me repeat these over and over and over again. Um, the very first thing is, what is a computer? I've, I've asked this question to many, many students, many, many classes, and people don't really understand what a computer is. Now, I can say a computer is a laptop, a computer is a monitor, a computer is a keyboard. But it's actually a little bit more complex than that. A computer is simply a system of systems. They can be very minute, they can be very large, but different integrated pieces working together as a whole. So your, while your monitor is not a computer, it's a computer component, your uh, laptop is a mixture of a hard drive and a motherboard and a keyboard, all of those pieces together make itself into a computer. So a computer is a system of systems. And the primary purpose of a computer is always to take raw, unprocessed data and transfer it into usable information. And if, as we go through this class, you're going to hear me talk about the difference between data and information. Data is unprocessed. Information is organized data. And most importantly, uh, every part of the information system is people. Now, you might think that the world's changing and we're going to have all of this artificial intelligence and automation, but the basis of every technology system, every system of system, there is a person. And we cannot break away from that, so no matter what you hear about or what's in the news, every system and system and everywhere we're going to grow into technology and the future of technology is based simply on you, the end user, the front end guy, the back end guy. It all comes down to a person. So I got a simple question for you. Now, everyone thinks they pretty much know this answer, and everyone thinks, ah, this is an easy question. How old are computers? I want you to think about this right now. Like I was born in the early 80s. I've been using computers most of my life, but you know, the Superman movie was built, made in 1979, where it had Richard Pryor playing on Brainiac, which is a computer system. So that's late 70s, early 90s. Uh, how old are computers knowing that a computer is a system of systems all right so we got a few people here have chimed in uh, on this this is an old poll uh, we have no one believes it's 1 to 20 years 21 to 30 years 31 to 50 years 100 to 1000 years or 1000 years plus so pretty much everyone agrees between about 31 to 50 years, you know, 1970s, 1960s maybe, if you're really pushing it, but really 1990s and above. So it's 30 years, 90s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, ugh. so 1990s and above is what most people believe. So what if I told you that technology computers are actually substantially younger, or substantially older than that? And if we're talking about computers, we go a huge different time frame. So computers of the modern age come down to five generations. Now we have these first five generations, our modern computing age started in 1944. 
Uh, that is the first computer generation of the modern age. It's used to vacuum tubes to store data. The second generation started around 1945. It used transistors to store data. Now you can see these giant pictures on the left-hand side of the screen here. These things took up masses of amounts of room. We're talking entire floors of building, their own heating system, their own cooling system, their own electrical system grids going directly to them, and they did next to nothing. Like they were as simple as you can possibly get. They required entire teams to input information into them. They were ridiculous. That's the first two generations of modern computing. The third generation started in 1958 and used integrated circuits. The fourth generation, 1971, we started using the microprocessor chip. And the next generation, the fifth generation, the one that we're about to enter into and we all talk more about when we go into the future of technology, is the quantum computing age. And so we have here the four generations of modern computing. Top left, 1944, 1945. We have the 1971 generation, which I absolutely love the image of that octagonal green weird little monitor there, but we have keyboard typewriters mixed in with computers, all kinds of fun stuff. We have our current generation of this uh, sleek desktops, laptops, and then we're going to go into the future in uh, the next generation of quantum computing. So that tells you that's the modern age. That's the modern technology. But how old are computers? So if the modern age goes back to 1944, that must mean that there is a previous age. Is that 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? How old are computers? What if I told you that the very first computer uh, came to be around is about 2,100 years ago? That's 2,000 plus years old. Now, this is about the same exact time frame for the birth of Caesar of Rome. And not just Caesar, blah, 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 the very first Caesar of Rome. Or for those of the Christian faith, this is about the same time frame that, oh, Jesus would be born. So, 2,000 plus years ago, in the age of Caesar and Jesus, we have the very first computer made. And now, this computer was an amazing piece. It's called the Anathakira Mechanism. Now, this artifact was recovered probably around July 1901. The data about it was sort of lost in the histories because no one could figure out what it was, so it was shoved in a museum for a hundred years. Now, the, this came from the Antithakira shipwreck of the Greek islands of Antikythera, which is why it's called the Antikythera Mechanism. It's been believed to have been designed and constructed by Greek scientists. The instrument has been dated between either 150 or 100 BC, and according to According to pretty recent views, we're actually looking at probably 205 BC. Its complexity and workmanship, once this thing was lost, did not actually come back again into the mechanical astronomical clocks of the European in the 14th century. So we have here a piece of technology that was created 2,000 plus years ago that has all the designation of a computer, and it got lost in a shipwreck. And it took... 2,000 years or 1,500 years before someone came up with something that even remotely realized its capabilities. The Anathikinera mechanism is amazing. This was lost in a shipwreck and found at the bottom of the ocean. In 1901, when the people originally found it, they pulled it up, and it's a rusted glob of junk, and they couldn't figure out what it was, and the weird spinning wheels. It wasn't actually till this modern age, till we had CT scanners and MRIs, that we were able to look inside the machine and actually found out what it does. This is the Antithakira mechanism. It was an astronomical calendar that was used to project when things like the Olympics were, when the uh, sun, moon, solar eclipses, those type of events happened for the uh, uh, ritual of Venus and all those types of Greek gods, remembering that this was a Greek computer during Greek time, so it did their lifestyle and their goals. It is so accurate that it actually still is accurate to this day. So you can connect, use this Anathenera mechanism today to discover when the Olympics were supposed to be based on their calendar back then, or when the next solar eclipse is, or the, those type of pieces. This piece of machinery is unheard of in ancient times. So who knows how many pieces we actually lost before that, how many pieces didn't make it. So we know that computers are at least 2,000 plus years old, but they could actually go back even further.
So this is the Antithagira mechanism. I strongly suggest you check it out. Now the reason this is called a computer is because at the very beginning of this lesson I told you a computer is a system of systems. Now you can see here we have a bunch of systems. We have a solar eclipse clock. We have the movement of planets and stars. We have a hand crank. We have all these pieces working in conjunction to get, take raw data and produce it into usable information. So we have a system of systems. <clears throat> and so we have this, a system of systems is just that, pieces working together in conjunction. So we have the Anthocanera mechanism is our very first known information technology system, a system of system, our very first computer. Now before all these modern generations, the five I told you about, including the modern age, we had an evolution of technology. We start off with us being uh, cave dwelling, uh, imbeciles, uh, banging on rocks and hunting apes and deers and stuff or whatever we did back before that. And then one day one smart ape decided to make fire and change the ball game. And we started doing all kinds of crazy things. So we have a law in technology that allows us to evolve our technology going from very basic to extremely advanced. <clears throat> this law is called Moore's Law, after Alan Moore, uh, uh, man, I know I just said Alan Moore, but I cannot remember what his first name actually is. I'm pretty sure it's Alan, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but Moore's Law states that technology doubles in capacity and halves in size every two years. This means an exponential growth of technology capabilities and speed. So we start off at the very beginning in the 1400s and we have some early technology and these all build into what is a modern technology. We have a printing pad press and after we made the printing press, you know, the very first printed documents, newspapers, books and those type of things, 200 years later, we discovered and make the first telescope. So that's extremely, uh, generations of people between sharing information with the printing press to, hey, we've shared this information, we'll learn a little bit about it from each other, and now we have a telescope. Now, 150 years after that, we had things like the steam engine, the telegraph, and the light bulb created. And then here in the early 1900s, uh, we have the telephone, the car, the Wright brothers' first flight, we have the oldest living person in the world, or she might have passed away at this point, um, was alive during this. So we have people in the world that came about, or were still with us right now, that existed before things like flight, before things like the beginning of the cars. Uh, so that's not that long ago. We're talking a couple generations, but people still existing that can talk about the before time. And so we have this exponential growth, and from the time we created the car in 1850 to walking on the moon was only 100 years. So we were, went from horseback to exploring the stars in 100 years. But from this, we can see a doubling and expansive and an exponential growth. From walking on the moon to the first computer, 50 years. From the first computer to 3D chips, 25 years. We're talking, as soon as we're hitting now, we're coming to a point, and we'll get into this in the future technology, where we have a runaway technology, a runaway capabilities of our materials. When we hit that point, we're going to hit what's called the singularity, where the technology is actually able to update and maintain and grow itself. We're getting very, very close to that. And we're going to hit this exponential growth faster and faster and faster to where the, from year to year, day to day, week to week, our world is going to change dramatically. But that's coming in a future technology lesson. Today, we're going to talk about that early curve. How did we get from the printing press in the 1400s to 3D chips and walking on the moon and potentially expanding out to artificial intelligence in the mid to early 2000s? It all starts off with a pretty simple invention, a Pascaline calculator. Now the Pascaline was a very first accurate mechanical calculator. This machine created by a French math mathematician was Blaise Pascal. Uh, you should know if you like math, the Blaise Pascal, the Pascal Triangle. He was a pretty big guy in math, came up with all kinds of things to torture high school math students with. It was created in 1642. It used revolutions of gears, uh, almost identical to the odometer of your car. And so as a number passed by and got to a certain number, the next dial would crank over, and we'd keep doing that over and over again. Now, the Pascaline could be used to add, subtract, 
multiple, multiply and divide. The basic design of the Pascaline was so revolutionary, so solid, so great, that no one made anything better for 300 years. Imagine right now, you as a student, you have probably in your possession a TI calculator. A calculator that you used in geometry or calculus or something of that nature that is mind-boggling good. That can do things that you would never imagine that can do. The TI calculator series, the 82, 84, Inspire, whatever that you particularly have, is re it's amazing. Imagine if you right now took that Pascal or that TI calculator and you handed it down to your child, and your child handed it down to their child, and their child handed it down to their child, and their child, and their child, and their child, and their child. And their child and in seven generations from now, your grand, great, your son, grandson, great son, grandson, great, great, grandson, great, 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 great grandson goes, man, grandpa really gave me a great calculator. That's what we're talking about with the Pascaline calculator. Seven generations of people said, nah, this is good enough. We mastered this thing is amazing. It was accurate. It could basically do math that no one was able to do by their hands. It sped up our mathematical calculations and our theories. It was ridiculous. This is the very first piece of our modern technology age. This Pascaline triangle, or Pascaline triangle, the Pascaline calculator actually sets the standards on what an information system should be able to do. Calculations, using raw data and pumping out a number, pumping out some good, solid information. Now, you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to take some drinks while we're doing this because I get dry mouth. So the Pascaline calculator was revolutionary. And you can absolutely check out more. You can actually go online and do an interactive Pascaline triangle or calculator if you'd like to play with one. Um, there are some in the uh, Smithsonian Museum. If you want to see one in person, it is fantastic. Now, after the Pascaline Triangle, we have the Jacquard Loom. That was 200 years after the Pascaline was developed, we have the Jacquard Loom. Joseph Jacquard revolutionized the fabric industry by creating a machine that automated the weaving of complex patterns. Now, it wasn't really a calculating or counting machine, much the same way the Pascaline was, um, but it was significant because it relied on these stiff punch card systems. So the Jacquard loom would look at a punch card, you can see there, it was just showing one in the video, and say this is how the pattern's going to be. It would load this up into a machine and the machine would look at the different patterns and actually create uh, the pattern uh, with the yarn or thread or however a loom works. I, I am not a loom worker or whatever you call that. But this punch card system of data entry and data manipulation actually stayed true into the early 1950s. We we're using this system in our very first computers. So ability to input raw data into a usable format and exporting a great solid information or modified data. Now the Jacquard Loom is actually making a comeback right now. Uh, not so much, no one's doing this by hand anymore. That's not something people do um, unless you're just really into... Um, weird old technology. Google is utilizing the Jacquard Loom to start weaving in integrated circuitry or pieces of the Jacquard Loom into clothing. So you can get smart shirts and smart hoodies and smart jeans, those type of things. So this old technology, while outdated and antiquated, is getting a revival with modification into our modern age. So this brings me up to an important person of our technology. I want to ask you, and I want you to picture in your mind, I want you to close your eyes and think to yourself, what does a computer programmer look like? Who do I picture in my brain that is a computer programmer? Now I'm going to take a wild guess and say for the majority of you, when you close your eyes, you have been trained by Hollywood, you've been trained by sitcom comedy, and you say, this is a computer programmer. Bottom of the basement, basement dwelling, neck beard that has no social skills and is a weird person to be around. Someone that uh, likes numbers and technology that sort of is outskirts of, uh, outskirts of society. That, this is what you picture when you see a programmer. But 
In reality, technology is a completely equilibrium. There is no specialty that requires you being a man or a woman or a basement dweller or a high society. In fact, we have the very first programmer in the history of technology, the very first computer programmer, was actually a woman. Now, Ada Lovelace was a mathematician. And at one point in time, mathematician work was actually considered uh, men's work. Her father was one of... I'm sorry. Uh, trying to move that out of the way. Was considered man's work. And Ada Lovelace was a trained aristocratic. She had high wealth, high background, and she pursued her passion and became a computer science person. She dreamed of building a flying machine. Uh, she actually patented one for an aerial steam carriage when she was 12. But she developed and designed the very first computer programming language. Now, this was super unique because computers didn't exist yet. So she theorized that computers would work on a binary system of language input, designed it, implemented it by her uh, incredible mathematician background before an actual computer was designed. It's ridiculous. Uh, she shouldn't have been able to do it, but she was so brilliant. So when I want you to picture a computer programmer. I don't want you to think to yourself, Ben, that's that neck beard basement dwelling guy. This is a computer programmer. Her father was one of Britain's greatest poets, but her mother, hoping to steer her away from those dangerous poetic tendencies, made sure she received tutoring in math and music, and it worked. Today, Ada Lovelace is considered by many to be the first author of a computer program, despite living a century before the invention of the modern computer. As long ago as the 1840s, Lovelace envisioned machines that could manipulate symbols instead of just numbers. And while there are some who would debate her title as world's first programmer, there's no denying her influence as a gifted mathematician who was also way, 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 way ahead of her time. Her father was the poet Lord Byron, and while he wasn't around for much of his daughter's life, he too encouraged her to pursue a career in science. In 1833, young Ada was introduced to Charles Babbage, a mathematics professor at Cambridge University, who today is commonly recognized as the father of the computer. Ada was 17, Babbage was 42, but intellectually they were peers. Ada soon met and married William King, the Count of Lovelace, and took on all the stuff that went with being a nobleman, wife, and mother, but she continued to correspond with Babbage for the next two decades. Babbage's most notable invention was the analytical engine, a brass and iron steam-powered machine he first envisioned in 1837. It included a central processing unit called the mill and expandable memory, which he called the store. Controlled by punched cards, which could be used to input data, the engine could be programmed to carry out different mathematical operations. In 1843, Babbage asked Ada Lovelace to translate a description of his engine written by an Italian mathematician. Over the next nine months, Lovelace did just that, but also appended her own set of notes, which ended up being three times longer than the actual translation. They included some of Babbage's own calculations, at least some of which she found errors in and corrected, but to demonstrate the machine's possible applications, she also described how it could be used to calculate an arcane, brain-teasing sequence of figures known as Bernoulli numbers. She proved it by diagramming the computations that the analytical engine would make, which, believe it or not, looked like this. Essentially, she had written a computer algorithm. She also speculated that the device might be used beyond numbers and could be used to manipulate anything within a fixed set of rules. She said it could be used for both practical and scientific purposes, and it might one day compose elaborate pieces of music of any complexity or extent. Basically all the stuff that we use computers for today. While the analytical engine was never built, Lovelace's translation was published and well received, earning her fans in Britain's scientific community, like pioneering electrochemist Michael Faraday. In 1852, at the age of 36, Lovelace died of cancer. It wasn't until 101 years later that her work was republished, just as people were starting to actually build the computers that she envisioned. And it became clear how prescient she was. Lovelace liked to call herself an analyst and metaphysician, but Babbage called her the enchantress of numbers. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow Great Minds. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for other great minds, you can let us know. Now, with all her impressive abilities, uh, the enchantress of numbers, Ada Lovelace was amazing.
But that's because she also had a mentor or a peer or a colleague who was the father of computing. Uh, Charles Babbage created what was called the analytical engine in 1834. And it was designed to be the first automatic calculator. Now, remember, we had the very first accurate calculator. Now, we're having the first automatic. It was called the analytical engine. The machine was actually based on another machine called the difference engine, which was a huge steam-powered mechanical calculator that Babbage designed to, pretend to print astronomical tables. Now, Babbage stopped working on the difference engine to build the analytical engine, and neither one actually ever got designed or ever got fully built until people went back, took his notes, and then built the machine. So this video you're watching right now going on behind me, that was that something that was created well after he had died uh, using his notes. And uh, though it was never developed, uh, Babbage's detailed drawings and descriptions of the analytic engine included components that we found in modern computers today. It included a store, which is very similar to our RAM systems in our computers, and a mill, uh, which was a central processing unit, and as well as it had input and output devices. It used punch cards, just like the Jacquard Loom, based on those desi designs, and the invention caused Babbage or caused Babbage to be given the father of computing. This machine and the theories behind it is exactly what we use in modern times. Everything this machine can do, though in simple complexity, has been built upon and built upon until you have your iPhone, your Android phone, your laptop computers. It was historic. Without Charles Babbage and without Ada Lovelace, we would not have modern computing systems. And the only reason to really, really know about Charles Babbage and his complexity machines, his analytic engine, is because Ada Lovelace took extensive, extensive notes. Why, she was herself brilliant, and she grew up the programming and theorized the future of it. Her work with Charles Babbage together is what formed our entire modern age. Now, well after Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, we have a guy that I just absolutely adore, mostly because that mustache is just amazing. In 1890, Herman Hollerith, which is the best name ever. I really hope that her, his parents one day when he was born looked down at him and said, you see this baby right here? This baby is going to be named Herman Hollerith. Because <laughs> it's ridiculous. Now, Herman Hollerith was working with the U.S. Census Bureau and was the first to take the Jacquard punch card system and apply it to a modern computer. Now, Herman was, like most modern people, very lazy. And the old survey system of the U.S. Census means you went door to door and you would ask them a question, how many goats do you have? How many people live here? How many chickens do you have? And you wrote it out by hand. Herman said, well... This is taking a lot of time. I don't want to do this. So he designed a system where he could just punch a card. How many goats do you have? I got six. Punch six. How many people live here? Four. I got four. And so he made this punch card system. Excuse me. To speed up his work. Now, Hollerith developed a machine called the Hollerith Tabulating Machine. That used these cards that he had gone door to door and get done uh, to calculate the tabulate calculate and tabulate the census data. So instead of having to sit there and tap it up by hand, he would just feed the cards into the machine. The machine would say, uh, in Oklahoma, we have 7,968 goats. So we have 14,000 people, blah, 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 blah. So it sped him up tremendously. Normally, the census would take 10 plus years to calculate the numbers. After everyone collected everything, they'd go to people and accountants and they'd sit there and calculate them by hand. Herman's cut that process down are just drastically. And he was successful at it. Uh, Holler's tablet machine automatically read data and had been punched onto small cards. It sped up the, the tabulation process. Holler's machine became so successful that he left the Census Bureau in 1896 to start a small company called the Hollerith Tabulating Machine Company, or Hollerith Machine Company. Now, this machine company later changed its name into something that's still actually in existence today. It came, became the International Business Machines. So we went from the Hollerith Tabulating Machine Company to the International Business Machines, or as we know it today, IBM, which is one of our biggest manufacturers of technology in existence in the world. Uh, in fact, in the 1980s, when um, Steve Jobs was 
adamant against going against the tech, big big technology and creating a new counterculture, it was IBM that he was going against. So IBM, at the very start of technology, at the very start of modern technology, modern computing, was there with Herman Hollerath. Now, after Herman, we have Alan Turing. Now, Alan Turing is a personal fan favorite of mine. Uh, I get a little bit fanboyish over him. Now, Alan Turing was a British mathematician. He created an abstract computer model that can perform logical operations. It was called the Turing machine. And it was not a real machine, but rather a hypothetical model that mathematically defined a mechanical procedure or a logarithm. Now, Turing's concepts described a process by which a machine could read, write, and erase symbols and then rewrite them, uh, written on squares of infinite paper tape. Now, this concept of an infinite tape that could be easily read, written, erased, and rewritten to was the very first precursor to today's modern RAM. He is quoted as being the father of theoretical computing science and the father of modern artificial intelligence. And some of his amazing pieces, and I strongly suggest there are several videos, movies about this guy. Go check them out. He's worth reading about. Uh, he created the Enigma machine uh, during the Great War. And it's one of the reasons we were able to defeat our enemies is because they had encoded uh, their messages and no one could break the encoding. But Alan created a machine, or Mr. Turing, that was able to break that encoding and allow us to keep saving lives. He was one of the key factors of winning the war. Uh, brilliant mathematician, brilliant on artificial intelligence. Uh, when he was a young man, he had a friend that wound up dying, and he was adamant that he could create a machine that could rebuild or recreate his friend's mind so that he can bring his friend back. This is what gives him the ability to be called the father of modern artificial intelligence. His theories have been put into place in modern times and continue to be some of the most fundamental pieces of what we do. So that, these are some of the most important people. So let's talk about some of the generations and get into some of the actual technology and some of the pieces that sort of set the stage for our modern computing systems. Now remember we have five generations of technology, five generations of modern computing. The first generation, about 1944, 1946 to 1955. Some of these do overlap. These first computers use vacuum tubes for circuitry Magnetic drums for memory and were enormous, taking up entire rooms. They were expensive, hard to operate, and used a great deal of electricity. The first computers generated a whole lot of heat, required their own air conditioning units to keep them down, and they malfunctioned nonstop. And these first machines used what was called machine learning, which is the lowest level of programming language understood by computers to perform operations. Basically, they used either a tube was on or a tube was off. They could only solve one problem at a time, and it could take days or weeks to set up a new problem, not to answer the problem, to actually input the data to be able to answer it. And these machines did basic mathematics. Mostly they were used in military use uh, to do trajectory for ballistic missiles and those type of things. But they were very, very low quality, but enormous time sucks. Some of the most important ones uh, the Z1 was built in 1936 by a German inventor, Konrad Zuse. He is created with the first created. He is created credited <laughs> with creating a mechanical calculator called the Z1. Uh, the Z1 is thought to be the first computer to include features that are in today's modern systems, including a control unit, a separate memory functions, and it was a binary, electronically driven mechanical calculator with limited programmability. Reading instruction from punch cards, just like the card loom, on a, cell, a, a film. Now, this original computer was actually destroyed during World War II, uh, during the bombardment of Berlin. But Zeus decided that his work was so important, and it, he was correct, he actually rebuilt the machine. And from World War II, to, it took him until 1989 to rebuild it. Uh, it is now on design. And you are free to actually go. I think it's in the German university. I don't know which one. But the Zeus Z1 has been rebuilt. And here we have uh, Mr. Zeus here with the rebuilt machine. And you can see just how physically large this single component of the machine actually is. Now, after Zeus, 
Uh, the next one, we have the Anastoff Berry Computer, or the ABC. It was built in 1939. The ni John Anastoff, <laughs> I have always screwed up his name, John Atanasoff and Clifford Berry built this first electronically powered digital computer. So we're talking about no more punch cards, called the Anastoff Berry Computer, or ABC. This computer is first to use vacuum tubes to store data, and most importantly, it was the very first computer to use the binary system, a series of ones and zeros. The design of the ABC would end up being essential to almost every single future computer system. And you can see here, it could do uh, more complex mathematics, uh, variables, and those type of things. Now, after the uh, Zeus, or ABC and the Zeus, uh, we have two people here. One I want to talk about quite a bit, uh, that is the great Grace Hopper. And from the 1930s to the early 1950s, Howard Aiken and Grace Hopper designed the Mark series of computers at the Harvard University. The U.S. Navy used these computers for ballistics and gunnery calculations. Aiken was an electric engineer and a physicist. He designed the computer, and Hopper did the programming. So we have here another example of programming typically in the past being a creative field, being amazing, and being inundated with women. Um, she did the, the uh, programming. The Harvard Mark I finished, the finished in 1944 and could perform all four arithmetic operations. could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So think about it. Everything your app on your phone can do for your calculator app is what this computer did. And you can see it is enormous. Now many believe Hopper's greatest contribution to computing was actually the invention of the compiler. It was a program that translates English language instructions into computer languages. So the computer can only read certain things. It, it needs on and off. It needs to read things in a machine way. For a human being to input that takes forever. It's difficult to understand, impossible to learn. So we have another person that was lazy and said, this is taking too long to do my job. I'm going to create something brand new so that my job goes by faster. Now, the Amazing Grace Hopper was not actually lazy in any way, and she is brilliant. So if you're going to read about anybody and you think, man, I, I don't want to learn about uh, the, the Turing, I, I don't want to learn about the Zeus, go online. Grace Hopper was alive here, until here recently, and while she invented the Mark I, that was not the only thing she did. The General Grace Hopper went on to do amazing things the entirety of her life. Uh, she has my absolute adoration. Now, but the compiler was a program that translates English language instructions into computer language. The team was also responsible for common computer-related expressions. In fact, the or Hopper and the Harvard Mark I was the first one to come up with the term debugging. Now, the reason this was is because the Harvard Mark I malfunctioned one day. It straight up broke down. And so they're going through and they're troubleshooting, they're figuring it out, and they're working on the Harvard Mark I, and they discovered that a moth, like an actual moth, had landed inside and shorted out a piece of the technology. So to fix it, they debugged the technology. They, they took the bug, the physical moth, out of the computer. So that's where a term debugging comes from when you're working on computers. <laughs> um, one of the very first programs to run on the Mark I was initiated on the 29th of March in 1944 uh, by a guy named John von Neumann. Uh, who worked on the Manhattan Project at the time and needed to determine whether the implosion of a viable choice to detonate the atomic bomb to be used a year later. So one of the very first things that ran after the Harvard Mark I was running was a calculation to see if the atomic bomb should be dropped. That was run on this particular computer with uh, Grace Hopper and uh, Howard Aiken uh, there working on it with them. It's, um, it's amazing. Now, the Harvard Mark I was a computed and printed mathematical tables, which had been, was the initial go goal of the British inventor Charles Babbage and his analytical engine. So we have Babbage's theoretical machine actually became a real machine with the Harvard Mark I 150, 200 years after he designed and invented it. Here is a section of the Harvard Mark I. Now, unfortunately, back in the day, people didn't see the value of outdated technology, so when this was taken out of service, uh, the majority of it was destroyed. Now, there are pieces of the Harvard Mark I both at Harvard on display and in the Smithsonian, but for the majority of it, it unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. 
Now, after the Harvard Mark I, we have a few computer pieces that really became cultural icons. One is the ENIAC, which is the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. And it was the very first electronic general purpose computer. It was a Turing complete digital and could solve a large class of numerical problems. So to Alan Turing's theory of a readable, writable, erasable, rewritable became realistic and implied here in the ENIAC. Now the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer ENIAC was another US government sponsored project. It was developed to calculate the settings used for weapons. It was created by John W. Mockley and J. Presper Eckert at the University of Pennsylvania and was placed in operation in 1944. Now, although the ENIAC is generally thought to be as the very first successful high-speed electronic digital computer, it was big, it was clumsy, and it did not work very well. The ENIAC used nearly 18,000 vacuum tubes, 18,000. And for those students of you that don't understand what a vacuum tube is, I'm going to use my uh, rock stuff here. The old school vacuum tubes were about the same size as my uh, medicine here. Uh, they're about four inches big, about two, three inches around, and each one was like the size of a light bulb and sort of functioned the same way. They were monstrous and they required a tremendous amount. So imagine 18,000 of these lining a wall, each one with a couple cables coming off going to different technology and computer systems. It was buildings worth of technology requiring gigantic resources and a whole teams of people to actually make them function. Uh, now the ENIAC took up 1800 square feet of floor space. It was inconvenient but it did serve its purpose and it was used up until 1955. Now ENIAC was formally dedicated at the University of Pennsylvania on February 14, 1946 and was the giant brain by the press, or heralded as the giant brain. Uh, to be a, an example, the ENIAC, when used, uh, could calculate a tra uh, trajectory of a, a ballistic missile. It would take a human about 20 hours to do it. The ENIAC was able to do it at 2,400 times increased speed. So instead of 20 hours, it might take 10, 15 minutes. So it was gigantic improvement on doing things by hands. Now after the ENIAC, we have the UNIVAC. Now the UNIVAC has two pieces here that really set it into place in um, cultural history. Uh, the Universal Automatic Computer, or the UNIVAC, was the very first commercial. So this was not just a government entity, it was sold to businesses. Successful electronic digital computer. It was completed in June of 1951. It operated on a magnetic tape, uh, so we had the Turing tape again. This is set apart from its competitors, which ran on punch cards. So we had the very first computer that's getting away from the punch card system, going to hard drives. But the UNIVAC actually gained notoriety, because in 1951, it did a publicity stunt. So Dwight D. Eisenhower was actually running for the president. And we before this, we had polling, we had all these type of things, and people were calculating it by hand. And Eisenhower was set to lose. Everyone, everyone said that Eisenhower had no chance of winning. Now, after analyzing only 5% of the popular vote, the UNIVAC correctly identified that Dwight D. Eisenhower as the victor. Now, after the UNIVAC did that, and this was broadcast everywhere, the news agencies were saying, oh, the stupid computers, guessing wrong, how great or how stupid and useless computers are, he won. And he was the overwhelming majority winner. And so the UNIVAC went on to become a household word. And the UNIVAC and computers like were considered the very first generation computers and were the last to use vacuum tubes to store data. Now, the other cultural piece of the UNIVAC and why it sets in is because in Superman 2 with Richard Pryor, which is a huge, big movie, Richard Pryor used the UNIVAC to create the Brainiac computer systems, uh, which created the bad, bad guy. So if you want to watch an old movie and actually see UNIVAC in operations, Superman 2 with Richard Pryor, you'll see the computer system being used both culturally and uh, historically together. Now, that's all the first generation. The second generation computers went from 1959 to 1965. They used transistors instead of 
the vacuum tube. So we went from something the size of my bottle here to something the size of the head of like a, a pin. Yeah. Our transistor started becoming that size. So you can see the difference. If I had 18,000 of these, it takes up an entire room. If I have 18,000 of these, it takes up an entire table. And so we had a massive shift in both the size and capabilities here in the second generation. They were more reliable, they were faster than the first generations, they were made without vacuum tubes, they used magnetic cores, um, they started using programming languages, came out with these that were high level instead of the very basic. We had things like Fortran and COBOL come out, and they're doing batch processing and multi-level programming, and we're operating on things with operating systems. There are a few big computers here in this that uh, well, you can look up if you're interested in. I won't go into detail. The IBM 1620, the IBM 7094, the CDC 1604, uh, the Univac 1108 are all second generation computers if you'd like to check them out. But they're not of significant cultural impact. They didn't shift the needle enough for us to talk about them in depth. But the big piece is of this are not so much the computers themselves, but the pieces that came out of this generation. The first one being gen are the transistor. In 1945, a scientist at Bell Laboratories invented the transistor as a means of storing data. It replaced the bulky vacuum tubes of early computers and was substantially smaller and substantially more powerful. A transistor is a semiconductor device used to amplify or switch electronic signals and electrical power. It's composed of semiconductor material and usually with at least three terminals to the bottom of it. Now, by turning a small input current into a large output current, the transistor acts very much like an amplifier, but it also acts like a switch at the same time, either on or off. When there's no current to the base, little or no current flows between the collector and the emitter, and so we can turn on the base current and have big current flows. And so this has allowed us to really power and up the capabilities and the magnitude of our computer calculations. Past the circuit board, or past the transistor during this second, second generation, we had the invention of the integrated circuit board. In 1958, Jack Kilby, while working at the Texas Instruments, or TI, invented the world's very first integrated circuit board, which was a small chip capable of containing thousands of transistors. This consolidation and design enabled computers to become very small and very light. So, don't know that I have. Here we go. So we have a hard drive here. And on the back of this hard drive, you usually have a green board or something of that nature. If you open up a computer, if you open up a TV, you're going to find these green boards. This green board is your integrated circuit board. So we went from a very long way from this very picture here to the, uh, the line here. What an integrated circuit board is, is just <coughs> lines of wires actually embedded into the plastic. And so you can hook your transistors directly to the board in uh, very close proximity to each other. Before this, we had to run a wire from the negative or positive terminal or whatever it was of the transistor to the next one. So we had to run a physical wire, which took up space, materials, and capabilities. So that is a big piece of the second generation. In the third generation, we ran from 1965 to 1971. The computers of the third generation used integrated circuit boards that were created in the previous generation in place of those transistors. Um, one of the key components of the third generation is everything was a home-built kit. Uh, there was no mass-produced computers for home users, but this is where we start seeing the PC, or personal computer, start integrating into society, people homebrewing and designing things, uh, themselves. Uh, they were small in size, cheap compared to the second generation computers. They were fast, they were reliable, they used high level programming, they had a magnetic core and solid state as the main storage. They were able to reduce computation, computational time and maintenance cost. And of course they had inputs and outputs. We had a monitor here with a tape reader, uh, some of them used cassette readers, they used a very different things. But the big piece of this, this generation is the microprocessor chip. Now, the Intel created the very first microprocessor, which was called the Intel 4004, or 4004. It was conceived by Ted Half and Stanley Mazur. It was assisted by Masatoshi Shima, Frederick Fagan, and, ex and his experience in Silicon Gate MOS technology. That's a big, it's a whole big hoopla of words there. Basically, these guys worked together to squeeze 
so we had the transistors uh, beforehand that were, you know, this big. Uh, so we're going from time frames of technology. We went from having vacuum tubes to having transistors, and now we're getting into the point where we have our transistors, and the transistors are size small enough to fit on the tip of a pen uh, at this time in our technology. So you can imagine, 18,000 takes up a room, uh, 18,000 takes up a table to 18,000 takes up a key on my keyboard. Shrinking, doubling in size, doubling capabilities. We have the expanse of Moore's Law happening at this point in time. And it brought up some very cool technology. In fact, we had the very first computer called the Altair. Now, the Altair was a 1975, it was sold as a kit, had no keyboard, used switches for input. Uh, had no monitor, used lights for the output. Uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen uh, were actually some of the very first owners of the Altair computer. They worked for Altair for a short period of time. Um, it cost $395 for a box of parts that you had to build yourself. Uh, and it had Altair's developers could write a compiler to run the basic computer language on the Altair. And so because Bill Gates and those guys worked for Altair, this actually caused them to break off and create the Microsoft company, uh, which, of course, grew to the world's largest wealth in the history of humanity. The Altair was simply a few pieces of electronics with flashing lights inside of a pretty box. It had no real anything, input, output, and did not store any information. So I want to show you the Altair in work. And I'm going to show you one of the very first video games that's ever existed. Now, this is a game called Chase the Bit. You can see right now, the person is actually programming the Altair. Switch on, switch off, click the button, store the data. Switch on, switch off, click the button, store the data. And so he's actually programming an 8-bit system right now with switches on, switches off, store the data, going through. And when he's done with all of his pieces, and he's inputted all of his data, let's see if I can jump to it real quick. So he's still programming the Altair right now. And I've jumped in front of this video a couple minutes here to get through this. And so he's still programming, still programming. Oh, all right, we're back here. So he's completely programmed his very first video game. He's turned it on. And the lights are flashing in sequence. So the goal here is to flick a switch and stop the bit when the light above the switch is on. So he's going to try his game here in just a second. He's got it, and he failed. So he gets to start the game over. Ah, he failed again, so the lights doubled in size, and caught it, and he won. Very first video game. So it took him 20 minutes to program this Altair. He played the game for five seconds, and now if he turns this computer system off, Everything will be erased, and he'll have to start over from the beginning. This is the Altair. In modern times, this would be about a $2,000 computer. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But the Altair was so popular and had such a market share, this went out to all the home brewers. This, Bill Gates had one. Steve Jobs had one. It hit Silicon Valley. It hit every home. This thing was everywhere. And because of the Altair, we had the rise of the video game system. Now, the Altair eventually got expanded off, had output that was actually visual, input of keyboards, operating systems, and programming languages. So we had the very first video game come out of the Altair called, uh, led to Zork, uh, Lead to Doom. And Zork is a text-based video game, um, It was, which led to Doom, which led to Halo, which led to Call of Duty, which led to everything. So every one of your video games could be based on Kill the Bit of the Altair or Zork on the Altair itself. Now during this generation we had some companies come about that were pretty big. We had the Apple with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Uh, they created the Apple One and Two. In fact, Steve Wozniak created the Apple One and Two and Steve Jobs created the Apple Company. Uh, 
St around this time, Altair was released by Steve Olsniak, who was an employee of the Hewlett Packard, was dabbling with his own computer design. Steve Jobs was working for a computer company named uh, Atari at the time, and they built these computer systems and built them and released them. Now you can see here, if you ever come across an old Apple computer that's made of wood, um, just give it to me. It's completely useless. Uh, no one in the real world would ever actually want it. It definitely didn't sell for over $300,000 at um, the big auction company here recently. The Apple One computer is the very first computer the Apple company created, and this was done in the 1970s. Now, after Apple entered the market and started actually producing, we did have some competition. Uh, two, two strong com competitors to the Apple machines were the Commodore Pete uh, PET 2001 and the Radio Shack TRS-80. Uh, Radio Shack's TRS-80 Model 1 sold about 10,000 units, and the machine had a price tag of $594, or about $2,500 in today's value, but it had a monochromatic display built into it. The TRS-80 was an amazing advancement over everything that was out there. It, it was better than the original Apple computers. It was better, better than the PET. It was beautiful and brilliant. Um, the name was a bit retro, even in the 70s. The TRS stood for the Tandy Radio Shack Computer. In fact, our Radio Shack companies became companies because they were selling this particular computer. Uh, the TRS-80 was the best-selling PC from its introduction through 1982. The Apple II steadily gained on it, but even in the late 80s, Radio Shack's machine had outsold the Apple II uh, more than 5 to 1. But poor marketing and a bad nickname, the Trash 80, uh, that caused this computer to absolutely fail. Now we are entered into the newest generation, which is the 1971 to the present. This is our current generation of technology, current generation of computers. Uh, this generation runs from 1971 pretty much ongoing. Uh, but we had some major computers and major con our modifications to technology. First, we had the fir our, our initial laptop. The Osborne company introduced the industry's first portable computer. It was called the Osborne One. It was in April of 1981. It weighed just a mere 24.5 pounds, which is comparable to carrying around, oh, I don't know, a two-year-old. Its screen was five inches wide. The Osborne cost $1,700 or almost $5,000 in today's value. Now this computer had no battery. It required, had no installed software, anything you deleted. or When you turned it off, it deleted everything. Uh, the biggest item about the Osborne was the fact the computer shipped with a large bundle of software though. You can load in two different disks that came with it. Uh, that was equivalent to the value of the machine itself. So the machine cost $4,500. They gave you $4,500 worth of software. And because the Osborne is a reason you don't pay for all your software when you get a first computer now. When the Osborne was announced, the uh, company sold about 11,000 units and a peak reached about 10,000 units per month. Unfortunately, the Osborne failed because they never came out with the Osborne II. When they finally got to market with it, people were so far gone from it, they just didn't care. And in 1980, uh, IBM was pretty much, or prior to 1980, IBM was mainframes. And of course, we know IBM from Herman Hollerith and the Herman Hollerith tabulating machine uh, from the earliest time frames. But in 1981, working with Bill Gates, the IBM came out with a computer um, it was called the PC, or Personal Computer. So PC is actually a copyrighted branded name from IBM. And it was sold through retail outlets such as Sears. It re reached the home market extremely quickly. And in January of 1983, Time Magazine named IBM PC the 1982 Machine of the Year. Uh, this beat out uh, what would be the Apple computers by a few months uh, to market. And it, Go check out Pirates of Silicon Valley if you want to see a more in-depth history of how that worked. But the IBM PC, if you grew up in the 80s playing Oregon Trail on a school computer, you probably played on an IBM PC. So the 1970s and 90s had a lot of big advancements that are worth noting, but not so much I want to get in detail with. Probably the biggest one, or one of the biggest ones, was programming. 
Uh, we had giant leaps and bounds in programming languages, operating systems, application software. We got to a point where we can actually start storing this data and sharing it out. And so once you start storing and sharing, people start modifying and growing, and we saw that exponential Moore's Law curve happen in real-time effect. Uh, we saw the industry in the 50s begin with punch cards and COBOL. We jumped into Algo and uh, Fortran. We got into BASIC with the uh, Altair, came out with the BASIC software. Excuse me, start, came out with BASIC, which was an extremely easy to use programming language. And we had things like input devices. Uh, you could input from uh, cassette decks, you could input from your phone, you could input, and not phone like we're thinking, they modern phone. You can input from real things, floppy disks, and so we were able to start storing and sharing. And of course, the operating system was also a huge piece during this time frame. Microsoft developed MS DOS, uh, put it on their IBM PCs. It was built by Bill Gates, and it's still in all your PCs today. You can actually get to your DOS screen from any modern PC. Now, after we had the operating system, we had some other pieces that came out that were pretty big that you still use today. Uh, the very first one was probably our software applications. Uh, you take it for granted today, but Microsoft Excel, how easy to use, was actually a pretty basic program back in the day, and it cost about $1,400. And so originally we had VisiCalc, which this is the original Microsoft Excel. It did no calculations for you. It was just a grid pattern, and you inputted the information you needed, and you can print that off. This cost you $1,400. So during the 1980s, during the 1990s, we had people homebrewing software left and right and selling it everywhere. And we had people just trying crazy things. And a lot of them stuck around. And a lot of them are developed even here today. We had the VisiCalc in 1978. Uh, our Word document, our Word processors came out in the 1980s. Uh, we had the Office type environment come out in 1993, or 1983, and we had the Excel type programs come out in 1985. Now, outside of our software, our operating systems used to be text based. You had to type everything C colon slash slash Windows dot uh, Windows slash user slash blah 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 uh, to open up any type of document. So you might go into C colon slash s doom dot exe and open up your video games. But then one day, uh, because of Xerox, we had the creation of the graphical user interface in the mouse. Uh, the GUI, or graphical user interface, was used to allow inter users to interact with the computer more easily. Before the GUI, everything was text-based. And this GUI was actually created by the Xerox company and then stolen by Steve Jobs and applied to the Apple computers. This is the very first GUI layout, the graphical user interface. It was magical. You can see something, click on it, and it opens up. Instead of having to type, 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 and remember commands, it was ridiculous. And we have this thanks to a company that thought technology was useless. Uh, in 1972, Xerox was a hard at work in its Palo Alto Research Center designing a PC of its own. And this PC was never released to the public. If it would have been, this PC would be the one we all use today. Uh, it's named the Alto. It included a mouse file management system directories, folders, included a word processor based on a what you see is what you get principle. It incorporated a file management system with directories and folders. And for whatever reason, the board of directors at Xerox said nobody would ever want this. And so they sold it to Steve Jobs for nothing, and he put it on the Apple computer, which gave him a huge market share and allowed him to build out the Apple companies. In fact, he put it onto this particular computer, the Apple Lisa, in 1983. It, when Steve Jobs introduced the Lisa, it was the first successful PC brought to market to use a GUI. It incorporated the user, similar, user interface similar to the Alto, included features such as the Windows, drop-down menus, icons, file systems with folders, and a mouse. Long ago, we didn't have these. Now, after the uh, Windows or the Apple Lisa, we have, of course, the Macintosh, which the company of Apple broke into two sections. The Macintosh eventually won. Uh, 1984, Apple introduced, the Apple introduced the Macintosh, which was everything Lisa was, and then some. It was about a third the cost. The Macintosh was also the very first computer to introduce the three and a half inch floppy drive and had a hard drive cover. You can see that in the bottom right hand corner. And so that was our storage input device. Now, we start getting into a new age in the uh, late mid to late 90s, and this is the internet boom. 
uh, the GUI allowed us to start the internet. Uh, without the GUI doing everything text-based, the internet was going to be a pretty terrible location. Uh, with GUI making it easier for people to use computers, the internet provided another reason for consumers to buy computers. They could do research, communicate with each other in new and convenient ways. In 1993, we had the very first web browser called Mosaic. Uh, the browser allowed users to view multimedia on the web and causing inter internet traffic to increase by ne nearly 350%. In 1994, Mosaic develop team uh, developed the first commercial web browser, Netscape. Now the key to Netscape and when it first came out is you had to purchase these. Uh, it cost money to buy Netscape to access the internet. So you bought your internet service provider and you bought Netscape. Otherwise you couldn't get online. Now Netscape popularity grew tremendously and became the prominent player for web browsers. Long before Google Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, or those type of things, Mosaic and Netscape were it. Uh, the companies discovered that the internet is a means to do business and decided sales were taking off and so they stopped charging for the web browsers, deciding that there was more valuable for you to get online than to pay for you to get online. And so in 1998, Netscape it was moving away uh, from the charge model and went to an open source market and no longer charged. So before 1998, from 1994 to 1998, the four, first four years of the internet, you had to charge to get online and top of your charge to buy the internet service itself. And this is our very first beautiful, just artistically done Netscape Navigator 4.04, the very first open source free to market Netscape browser. This is how we got online. This is a web page. This is not just an information. It was useless. <laughs> Everything was stagnant. Everything was garbage. It was slow. It was ugly. If someone picked up the phone while you're on the internet, you lose everything. It was awful. But this is what started the internet boom. Without the very first open source Netscape, you would not be playing online right now. Google Chrome wouldn't exist. Uh, Internet Explorer wouldn't exist. These things came about because Netscape proved it was valuable to do. So at this point in time, if you have any questions, we've covered the five generations computers. We've covered important people. We've encouraged covered important places, we've even covered important technology advancements, theories, pieces, uh, from Ada Lovelace, uh, Charles Babbage, to Alan Turing, uh, to the UNIVAC and ENIAC. You've gone over a lot of information in this video. If you have questions, comments, concerns, you want to explore more about it, reach out to me at Logan Period Phillips one at TulsaCC.edu. Send me an email. Reach out to me with phone by 918-595-7485. Let me know what you think. Let me know how you're doing with this. Go in and research some of these people I talked to you about. I did not do them justice. There is such greater, more knowledgeable people about the subject matters and the stories about these people's lives and the things they did will just blow you away. I hope you have learned a little bit uh, that it was at least a little bit entertaining. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, give me a call. Let me know. Otherwise, have a very fruitful day. Bye, guys.